Good morning. The most frequent question that I get when I speak about computers is how the computers of the future will look like. And clearly, everybody has its own idea on how it should look like. And clearly, Hollywood help us to uh, push forward our imagination. I've been teaching computer science for some time now at the university. And I've been also thinking how they will look like. Honestly, I do not know the answer. But I know one thing that will be for sure a feature of future computers. And it's that they will consume much less energy than today. And why is that? It's because today, the amount of energy that is consumed by information and communication technology is rising. It is becoming an important fraction of the total energy consumed all over the world. As we can see here, we are approaching 5% of the total energy use, excluding uh, a number of components that are close to, strictly speaking, information and communication technology. Not only the amount of energy consumed becoming more and more important with the uh, increasing diffusion of uh, information and communication technology, but also the fraction, uh, the amount of uh, CO2 production is increasing. And this is a concern uh, not only for uh, scientists and technology people, but also for politics. If you look at ICT devices, you can see that they actually span an entire range of energy consumption. Uh, we go from very tiny devices, like RF, RFID tag, that take up a power of 10 microwatts, and then we can scale up until uh, the top of the list, where we have this uh, supercomputing system. Today, we are facing the problem of uh, designing the new exascaled computers. This is the new frontier in high-performance computing. And it has been estimated that an exascale computer will take something like 20 megawatt of power to be operated. That means that if you want to build a supercomputer, you have to build a power plant nearby. Otherwise, it will not be able to, to, to make it work. On the green side here, we have, uh, of the list, we have uh, a number of solutions that today go under the, word, uh, the name of energy harvesting technologies. It means uh, technologies that transform energy from the environment. And also in this case, you can see that uh, there is a wool range, spectrum range. Still, these technologies are too weak. They are not able to power most of the mobile devices that we want. And I'm sure that you are very familiar with the terrible problem of having the battery of, of your mobile phone or your iPad just running out. So I hope I was able to convince you that reducing energy consumption is of strategic importance. As I said, it is of strategic importance if we want more powerful computers and we want to avoid microprocessor burning all the power, a, a la very large fraction of the power used in a supercomputer is nowadays dissipated into heat, okay? Just wasted. And this is just to give you an idea about uh, microprocessor units. And uh, nowadays, we, have, we are flattening out a little bit, but simply because we have introduced the multi-core uh, control processing units, meaning we have increased the, the surface. In fact, uh, here we are reporting the power density, meaning the number of watt per square centimeter. And we are close to 100 watt per square centimeter, which is a huge amount of power. And in fact, all this power needs to be dissipated into heat to prevent uh, the burning of the microprocessor itself. Also portable CPUs are increasing uh, uh, with time their energy demand. There is another reason why we need to reduce energy, and it's if we want to make the Internet of Things a reality. Internet of Things is based on portable, mobile, small devices. For these devices, the usual battery is not a viable solution. These devices can be so small that replacing battery is certainly not an option. 
So once again, we need to reduce the amount of power needed if we want to operate and to make uh, the Internet of Things uh, a reality. This is just to give you an idea of total power consumption. I've already mentioned the high performance computing, which is eating, this is one megawatt, one million watt, meaning one million joule per second. And we are facing 20 megawatt for the next generation of high performance computing. But also, uh, uh, our PCs are taking up uh, an increasing amount of power, and now portable MPUs are joining in. Portable MPUs are the, the, the central processing units that you find in your mobile phone, just to give you an example. Now, what can we do? Okay, people have been thinking about this problem for some time now. Uh, I have uh, the privilege to be at the university, so I do not need to provide a viable solution right now, okay? So I can start thinking more vague ideas. Nowadays, we, we, we call, this is an academic question, right? Because this question that, okay, it's academic, it's not so practical, not so interesting. So this is my point of view. I wanted to start with an academic question, so I started asking this kind of question. If I could build any machine for doing computing, what is going to be the minimum energy required to do computation with it? Or if you want, can we design computers that are operated without spending any energy? Is there a minimum amount required? Is there any fundamental physical law, principle, that required to spend some energy? Why can't we build a computer that is operated without spending energy? Why energy is needed to do computation, if any? Okay, surprisingly enough, the answer to this question is not completely clear. That means that in the scientific community, and technological community, there is no complete uh, agreement on what is the answer to this question. In fact, uh, if you look at this picture, you can see that here we reported, the, this is a quite recent, uh, it's the ICT Energy Research Agenda, and this, these are a number of microprocessor units, and here we reported the power dissipation per gate, measured in watt. A logic gate is the elementary brick of any microprocessor. So this is for each of these microprocessors. These are uh, commercial microprocessors. You can see where they stand on this scale. This is the power dissipated per logic gate. And it's interesting to see that you can also see these lines. These lines are believed to be fundamental limits. And I want to point your attention to this red line here which is the so-called Landauer limit at 300K, this is the temperature. So if you want to operate a computer at room temperature, this is supposed to be a fundamental limit. So we wanted to understand if this was true, so what we did, we started to do some studies and also some experiments. I must tell you, I love physics. I love physics very much, not only because I'm a physicist, because physics brings you something which is uh, priceless. People start discussing about a topic and they can go on discussing for decades. This happened many times in science, okay? Then somebody comes that are completely unaware of the discussions, it does an experiment and this changes everything. And it's beautiful. It happened many times in history. Well, this is what we wanted to do. So we had this ambition, okay? Forget about this long discussion about the, the fundamental limits here. Can we do an experiment to see if we can do something? And this is what we did in my laboratory. And exactly a few months ago, we built a new kind of logic gate, which is different from these logic gates. And these logic gates was, we were able actually to operate it at this level of power, which is way below this line that was supposed to be a fundamental physical limit. Okay, now, if you want to know more about this, you will find details on this paper. Uh, this paper is presently submitted to uh, Nature Physics, and we are waiting for the, uh, the response of the referees. What is interesting here is that, is that you can see that all these devices are characterized not only for the power dissipated, but also for the frequency. I mean, on this side, you have the most 
uh, fast devices. On this side, you have the slow devices. It's interesting to see that we also quoted the neuron. Neuron is supposed to be the elementary cell of our brain. And uh, if you take the switching time of a neuron and the amount of energy required, it, uh, it is on this side. So it takes way more, way less energy than uh, a normal microprocessor, but it's much slower than the other. So our logic gate stays on this side. So it's quite slow compared to uh, the fast microprocessors, but it's way below uh, in uh, terms of power. And most importantly, it's below this uh, supposed fundamental limit. Uh, OK, now you want to know how does it work, OK? Clearly, because I could just made up a, 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 an announcement. No, we actually made it. And it's quite a simple device. It's a micro electromechanical logic gate. And it's based on this principle. Let's suppose that you have a very small cantilever. And then you can uh, apply, let's suppose the cantilever is made of uh, dielectric material. So if you come close to the, this material with uh, an electrode, and applying a voltage at the electrode, you can establish an electrical force that it's able, capable of bending the, the cantilever to some extent. So uh, according to the fact that you apply or do not apply a voltage here, you can uh, establish a bending or non-bending of the cantilever. And in this way, you can establish two logic state, for example, 0 and 1 in a binary logic system. OK, this is a picture of the cantilever just to give you an idea what we are talking about. And the device is very small. We are a uh, few microns on this side, uh, below one micron, I mean, a uh, few hundred nanometers in uh, thickness. And we did an experiment uh, by uh, uh, applying, of course, uh, voltages here to see the bending. And the bending can be measured by shedding light and seeing the reflection with what it called uh, its uh, shadow meter uh, technique. By operating a logic gate in this way, you can actually realize uh, what is called uh, an OR gate uh, by assigning logic values to the two inputs and looking for the, the response of the system according to the bending. And you can see that this is uh, uh, operated according uh, a true table, which is OR gate. But you can also make uh, uh, a NOR gate, which is universal, so more interesting than simple OR gate, by coupling uh, a number of these logic gates. So the idea is that you could actually, in principle, make a computing device by coupling a number of these electromechanical uh, logic gates. What we learn uh, on doing this, and this is also the message that I would like to, to leave you uh, today. First. We do not know how the future computers will look like, but we know that they will consume less energy. And this is of strategic importance for the future of ICT. Second, there are no limits to the minimum energy required to operate a computer. Nowadays, we believe that we established this, and we are very positive on this term. Third, future technology not necessarily will be semiconductor-based, meaning if we really want to make a breakthrough towards zero power computation, maybe we should start thinking beyond CMOS technology and look for some other uh, technology. Clearly, in this case, there is still a lot of room to go. So we are not looking for an incremental progress. We are not looking for uh, improving efficiency of 10% or 20%. We are looking to an improvement of five, six orders of magnitude, means one millionth less energy required. OK, if you want to know more, uh, join us. We are organizing a networking session at the next uh, ICT conference. It uh, will be held in Lisbon on the 22nd of October. Uh, you, will be, uh, you will find us there. And if you want to know more, you can check uh, this website. And this work has been developed under two uh, projects funded by European Commission under the FET uh, program. A uh, project called Landauer, Fat Proactive, and ICT Energy, again, Fat Proactive. Uh, thank you for your attention.